Now, I ask you at the beginning of of this assembly, who needs to be reminded of your sin? Anybody? Do you need to be reminded of your sin? Do Do you really, are you unaware that you're a sinner? No. Do you, mean, do you need me or others to constantly remind you of how bad you've been? How do you feel when you're constantly criticized? This came from a conversation, by the way, earlier, and it was just an interesting conversation. But how do you feel when you're constantly criticized? You know, I, I've watched parents with their kids, and I notice sometimes, often, what they hear more from us as parents, more criticism than compliment, more down than up. You need to straighten your room better. You need to do this better. Straighten up and sit upright and stop talking so much. Would you calm down? Would you straighten up? We, sometimes we expect our kids to be a lot older than they are, but they, they're constantly being criticized. In fact, so much so that if psychologists are right, and it takes seven, seven positive strokes to counteract one negative, oh, my goodness. Some of our kids are so far behind on that, I mean, they, they are deep in debt with criticism. It's going to take their lifetime and two more just to catch up on the seven to one ratio. My suggestion to you who have younger children, take off your critical gra- glasses and start trying to catch your kids doing things right. Compliment them. You can compliment kids into behavior that you cannot criticize them into changing Catch them doing something right and compliment them. Praise them. They'll continue to do what's better and they will decrease in what's bad. Don't pay as much attention. Am I right about that, Mike? I mean, this is like sound counseling technique, right? It's as if I've actually been counseled on that or something. Uh, I'm here to tell you that that does work and it will really radically change your kids' lives to hear positive, especially things like this. I so love you. I am so proud of you. Man, I am glad God gave me you. I'm glad you're in my family. I'm glad I'm your dad. I'm glad I'm your mom. Whatever it is, whatever role you play, I would not say I'm glad I'm your mom. But the point is that I'm very painfully aware of my sin. In fact, it seems like that's all I see sometimes is how how, how many times I miss the mark. And I already have a constant accuser who walks with me through the day. How about you? We have satanic forces who know our weaknesses and know where we fail. And we hear words like this. And you call yourself a Christian? Who do you think you're fooling? So if you think I overemphasize forgiveness or grace or mercy, it's only because you overemphasize your sin. And you're critical. You're highly critical of yourself. And you need to be grace-filled. The Bible says the grace of God teaches us how to say no to sin. And grace, by the way, means this, God's power at work in me. It may mean that his power is at work in me to provide forgiveness. But grace is also necessary to overcome sin. Now, we have an example today from Scripture. Mark chapter 2, and there's some other passages listed in the bulletin. There's... Uh, I hope you get the bulletin by email. If you don't, you need to see Kathy and give, make sure she has your email. And then once you get it in your email, open it. And once you open it, read it. But there's a there's really uh, interesting set of questions for us to consider. I'm not going to look at all of them today, but for those of you who want to take this message on in your life group later, this would be a, a good set of questions to discuss. So I want you to consider what happened. Jesus was... His popularity has been increasing, and he came to his own hometown. Where do you consider your home? If you said, man, this is home to me, where would the home to me be? Some of you were born and raised here, right? And I was born and raised in West Virginia. That will always be home. But quite honestly, everywhere we've lived, we've lived in several different houses, and not all of them have been home. And one of the keys of making something feel right and family is that that house is no longer just a house to live in, but it's actually a home. Well, the Bible says that Jesus came to his home. And while he was at home, a whole crowd of people came. And they crowded this house so much that while he was teaching, some friends who had brought their 
I'm sorry to say Broughton, that's Idaho talk. Some friends who had brought their friend who was paralyzed to see Jesus, just on the chance that maybe he might heal their friend, found that the crowd was too big and they couldn't worm their way through to bring their friend to Jesus to be healed. Not to be put off, they climbed up to the roof, taking their friend with them, tied ropes or sheets or something, and lowered the man through the roof right in front of Jesus while the crowds were watching. So here's this man kind of hanging there, or they dropped him all the way to the ground. I just see him kind of hanging there sort of eye level right in front of Jesus. The Bible doesn't say if he hit the ground or not, but there he was. He's got to trust his friends, doesn't he? Right? And his friends have got to trust that Jesus is actually going to do something, but maybe this is enough to grab the master's attention. And the Bible says, seeing their faith, T-H-E-I-R, seeing their faith, not his faith, but their, his and theirs. Now, I'm assuming that since he's paralyzed, if they said, let's take in Fred and bring him to Jesus, he didn't have a whole lot to say about that, right? So the there could be just the four, but I think he was included. Maybe he was the one who said, do you think it's possible? Jesus has been healing so many. You think he could heal me? I believe he could. If we could just get him to to touch you, to see you, to, to give you attention. I think he could. I even think he would. And so they were bringing him to Jesus, but they were cut off. But they were not deterred. They went to the extreme and lowered him before the master. And Jesus looked at the man with great compassion, saw their faith, and gave the man what he came for. Right? No. And this is what's startling about the passage. He does not give the man what he came for. He gave the man more than he came for. He said, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm wondering... Yeah, well, I know that's what the crowd said. I mean, the crowd and the religious Jews said that. We're going to look at them in just a moment. But I'm wondering, how did the friends feel at that point? Disappointed, maybe? Hey, we didn't bring him for forgiveness. We brought him to be healed. What do you mean your sins are forgiven? Is that all you're going to do? Is that what they were thinking? Maybe. What about the man who's paralyzed? He hears these words... Your sins are forgiven. Do you think he said, wait, I came here for healing and all you're going to do for me is forgive my sins? Or did he say, really? My sins are forgiven? Guys, let's go home. I got far more than what I came for. Here's what I think. When you're paralyzed, as this man was, and being always immobile and others always taking care of you, do you have alone time? Do you have downtime? Do you have time to think things through? Do you review your life over and over? Do, do you even think about maybe what led to the paralysis? I don't know what led to the paralysis, but I've heard stories about car wrecks, which I know would not be the first century, but car wrecks, maybe it's a donkey wreck. Uh, an, an accident of some kind. You know, People do stupid things. They go out and party and get drunk and then t- dive into an empty pool, snap their neck, paralyzed from the waist down or from the neck down because of sin in their lives. They were partying like wild animals and not thinking the consequences and getting drunk. You think maybe there might be some regret over. Maybe even he's gone to the temple and he's offered sacrifices and God has promised you offer these sacrifices in this way, your sins are forgiven. But how many of you, when God forgives your sins and you know they're forgiven, still review in your mind about your previous sin? 
How many of you still feel guilty about some previous sin? Now, this one, I do want to see your hands. How many of you feel guilty about previous sins that you know God has already forgiven? How many of you have asked God more than once to forgive you of sins that you know he's already forgiven? Why is it? Why is it so hard for us who have walked with Jesus so long to accept his forgiveness and move on? I'm so you've fallen. I don't want to minimize this, but you've rebelled. You fell. You have pain in your life because of that. So you can either accept the forgiveness, get up, dust yourself off, and move on, or you can stay there and wallow in the guilt that does not exist. It's it's gone. As far as the east is from the west... Buried deep in the ocean, the blood of Jesus has obliterated it. Yesterday, I was wearing a bright red shirt and got into the water with Amelia. And I said, you know, this red shirt makes me think of, though your sins are as red like scarlet, they're they're crimson. I will make them. And it was snowing at the time outside again. It was snowing. I said, so every time, this is my encouragement to Amelia, who, if you haven't met her, open season on her neck today. Well, hug her and welcome her into the family. Here's the point. I want to encourage you to do the same thing that I told her yesterday. Every time you see snow, make that a reminder to you, that's how God sees you today. Pure white snow. I like that. Every time you dish out some ice cream, maybe, vanilla ice cream, pure white. Anytime you see something pure white, think, that's how God sees me. Red as crimson with my sin. White as snow in the eyes of God. Are you going to emphasize your sin over his forgiveness or his forgiveness over your sin? Now, do not emphasize his forgiveness over your sin to the point where it really doesn't matter what I do, he's going to forgive me anyway. May I give you the Greek word for that? Stupid. (laughs) Jesus used the word moronos, which is where we get our word moron. You fool, you moron. Don't take his forgiveness for granted. Don't just keep on sinning. You're going to walk your way right out of the presence of God. If I read my Bible correctly, you let go of his hand. He's not going to force you to grab back, but he will knock at the door. If you open up, I'll come in and have supper with you. That, that was written to Christians who had turned their back on the Lord. His forgiveness. God's, this is, this is something important. And I say that because sometimes people who hear me speak or teach, they don't recognize my really important statements from my non-important statements. This is profound. God's love is unconditional. His forgiveness is conditional. You've got to receive it and you need to keep on walking in it. If you reject it, he's not going to force his forgiveness on you. Got it? That's to have relationship with him. And if that's true now, that's true anytime. To have relationship with God is your acceptance of his forgiveness. So stop focusing on your own failure. Communion is not designed for us to look at our sin and how bad we've been. It's to look, as Max pointed, to the power of the cross and how powerful he is to cover our sin. Yeah, I'm reminded. if, If you don't remember where you came from and where you're headed, you're blinded and short sighted, you will fall back into sin again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, I don't know, 7 or 8, 9 says that. But the focus of the cross nails the sin once and for all to set you free and to be pure and white in the presence of God. Clean and forgiven. I believe the man looked at Jesus and said, Wow. I got far more than I ever came for. 
take me home. But a great religious discussion started there, a big argument. The, the Jewish leader said, who does this man think he is? God? Only God can forgive sins. Which, by the way, the Bible clearly teaches. Only God forgives sins. Ultimately, completely, end of story, exclamation point, final. Only God forgives sins. That is true. And Jesus here says, wait a minute. May I ask you a question? You're asking, does he really have the power to forgive sins? You're challenging me here. By the way, it doesn't say that they actually asked the question. It says they were reasoning in their hearts, and Jesus knew what they were thinking. Maybe there was some whisper back in the crowd. Who's this man think he is? But no one had challenged him verbally at this point. But he knew what was on their heart, and he said, Why are you asking in your hearts, does this man have the ability to forgive sin? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or take up your mat and walk? Well, let's count the words. Your, even in English, in Greek, it's pretty much the same. Your sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk. Huh. Either one of them is easy to say. But let me prove to you by doing something that you can see that is impossible to do. That if I can do this, that proves this that you cannot see. Can you see forgiveness of sins? Can you put forgiveness in a test tube? Can't see it, can't taste it, can't touch it. Is it real? You can't see it, taste it, touch it. It's real? Yes, it is real. But for you to know that the Son of Man has the ability to forgive sins, he turns to the man in the mat in front of him and says, take up your mat and go home. And suddenly, I don't know what this must have felt like, now, what do nerves regenerating within the spine, connecting and bringing about muscle growth? Because this atrophied muscle, that hadn't, this guy hadn't walked for a while, I'm guessing. Right? And, and so to get this whole body re, totally rejuvenated to where, what does that feel like? I don't know. But whatever it was like, it was like he knew something happened. And the man immediately got up, rolled up his mat, and walked through the crowd. And everyone was watching. And as they were watching, here's what happened. I mean, their jaw dropped, their eyes were big. It's like, this is impossible. And then somebody in the back was started thinking, wait a minute. He just did the impossible. And he just said the impossible. If he said it here and it happened, and he said it here, it must have... Ah, he can forgive sins. But wait, 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 wait. Only God can forgive... Oh. Somebody somewhere's got to be thinking, could this be God? And the answer is yes. And who does he think he is? God? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I mean, when Jesus forgives sins, it's a clear statement of his divinity. Or he really is guilty of blasphemy. Because no one has the right to forgive another person's sins with respect to eternal judgment and completely healing a person than God himself. And Jesus claimed to be the one able to forgive sin. If he's not able to, he is guilty of blasphemy and he deserved to be nailed to the cross. If he is able to forgive sins, he really is God and we need to bow before him and worship him and give him our lives. Now let's look at who was involved in the man's healing. Well, I believe they had enough faith, trust, that God would heal the man, but I don't think they had enough trust that he would forgive him. What do you think? Which is, which is harder, to forgive or to heal? I would say it's harder to forgive than it is to heal, though it's easy to say either one of them. And you, just, you could argue, well, 
Jesus is God, and it's not hard for him at all. Anyway, let me, let me challenge that for just a moment. Jesus is drawing on the account that he has yet to pay into. Upon what basis does Jesus forgive sin? Well, the faith of the person. That's what it is. Before you get to the faith of the person, upon what basis does Jesus offer forgiveness of sins? Upon what basis does God ever offer the forgiveness of sins? And if you look over my right shoulder, your left hand, and you're cued into only on the, only on the basis of the cross of Jesus, you hit it. There's target. It is only on the basis of Jesus on the cross that he legally, legitimately paid for our sins. And on that basis, whether people lived before the cross or after the cross, it is only through the blood, the death and the blood of Jesus and his resurrection that God will forgive any sin. So that any person of faith who does what God says and God says you're forgiven... It's only because Jesus died for the sins. Now, which is easier to do? Heal the man or forgive the man? I'd say Jesus for Jesus. It cost him everything. Which is easier? It was a complete sacrifice. Which is easier? We spit on him. We whipped him senseless. We nailed him to the tree and watched him suffocate a long six-hour death. Which is easier? All three had a role to play. Jesus offered the man healing and forgiveness. But it took all three, the friends, the paralytic who was willing, and Jesus who was the giver. Notice he used his extreme power to do the greatest service for that man. Last point. Who was the one who took you as the paralyzed victim in your own sin and brought Jesus to your life? Upon what basis? Maybe it it wasn't that you were looking for that, but that somebody connected with you. Like somebody comes to church because they were invited and they came for a meal, but they found forgiveness. Somebody came to a group to study English so that they could sharpen their English skills. They came for English and they discovered who Jesus is and forgiveness. Somebody went for coffee with you because you offered to pay for coffee, but in the process they heard Jesus. You became friends with somebody at school who they asked you, could I borrow a sheet of paper? And all they were looking for was paper, but they ended up becoming your friend and they heard about Jesus. Uh, Somebody calls me and says, would you do a wedding for us? My immediate answer is, of course. I'd be happy to. How much do you charge? I've told you some of this anyway, but I charge $100 for a wedding. But if you'll meet with me four times, I'll knock off $25 for each. So my part of the wedding would be free. Really? So if we meet for you six times? We... <laughs> some are very enterprising. <laughs> You know, what if we meet you 12 times? <laughs> this is a profit for us, right? <laughs> and, and I try to get them in. You know, some will contact me because uh, I'm trained in Prepare Enrich that helps premarital counseling and postmarital counseling to give the tools. And that Michael and I have talked about working together where I could administer the, the tools and he and I would work together in helping couples strengthen their relationship based on the assessment tools of Prepare Enrich. But I can do prepare part and do the pre counseling. And what prepare does is it allows couples to see what their strengths are and what their potential strengths are. And helps them look at where their rose colored glasses are. Which, by the way, some will pay attention to, and some, because they have on the rose colored glasses, it only makes it brighter. Oh, if it's that good, it's going to be even better. <laughs> Probably not. That's why I have postmarital counseling. So. <laughs> But because they came for that or they came for the wedding, I'll be if they didn't find Jesus in the process. One guy said, would you do a wedding for us? And I said, sure. When are you thinking? He said, this Saturday. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, this Saturday. Can you do it? This is in Port here in Michigan. I said, yeah, I can do it. But I always encourage 
four times to meet with me. He said, we will meet with you four times for sure after the wedding. I promise you. I thought, yeah, right. I've heard this kind of thing before. We'll meet with you four times. Will you do the wedding? I said, on the basis of your promise, I'll do the wedding. So Sam and Julia and I met with two of their witnesses. It was just the five of us. And I said, do you, do you, you are. And they were. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. We're ready for our first session. Really? Yeah. We met at McDonald's, my favorite place to meet and counsel couples. <laughs> hey, a dollar drink, come on. <laughs> and so here we are sitting, talking, and, and in the course of talking, I jumped ahead in their second session. I just combined two because they're already married. And, and I started presenting Jesus. And I wasn't 30 minutes into our conversation, and Sam stopped me and said, I have never heard this before in my life. I have been praying that God would help me understand his will for me. Would you baptize me today? No kidding, no joke. And so they came to me for a marriage. They got Jesus and forgiveness in the process. That's not because of, oh, look at me, aren't I great? That's because... Any one of us is a part of somebody's life, a neighbor you can give a smile to, somebody who's hurting you can give a hug to and cry together with. They came to you for condolences. They came to you for help. They came to you for just a friendship. They came to you for a smile. They came for you for a sheet of paper. They came to you for a test. They came to you for something. And they're going to get that and Jesus and forgiveness because that's who fills your life and you've experienced too good of good news just to keep it to yourself. And so you're going to spread it to everyone that you get an opportunity to. And I sat here in the... In the f- well, I'm ready for that. I know I'm crying. This is exciting. I sat here on the front pew talking to a million. I said, why do you want to follow Jesus? Why do you want to be baptized today? She said, I want Jesus to give me direction in my life. I love him and I want to be with him forever. And I quote, I want to help other people come to know Jesus. I nearly hit my knees. 12 to 13, I want other people to come to know Jesus. 40 to 50s, where are we? Why do we keep quiet? Maybe because we haven't truly accepted it ourselves. Man, this is too good a news to be true. You truly are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Bathe in that today, would you? Let that fill your heart. Let that stimulate you to move from the head to the heart to the mouth to the hands. You be a part of others. Why not be the friend who initiates the conversation to take the paralyzed one in sin to the presence of Jesus? I want to ask you to pray with me. Lord, uh, I agree with Max. This is real. This is time to take things seriously, and we don't have much more time in this world. Things are getting worse, and we're expecting you to come back uh, any moment. And there's some people we know and love, and we want them to know you, and uh, we haven't done much to get them to you. We haven't done much to heal our own homes and our own relationships because you've forgiven us we haven't learned very well how to forgive others and how to be reconciled to go the extra mile to do whatever it takes to bring forgiveness and love and reconciliation in our major relationships I I pray that you'll help us do that help us God to see ourselves the way you do would you please make this lesson somehow important, important enough to each of us to act on in some way and accept your grace and power and forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Let's all stand and sing.